Welcome, everyone. I'm Councilmember Joyce Clark. I recognize a lot of you, but I don't know some of you. Some of you are new faces to me. Um, we're going to do some housekeeping things, and then I'm just going to ask you to tell me who you all are so that I can put a name to a face. A uh, couple of housekeeping things. Make sure you sign in and make sure you fill out a raffle ticket, okay? So if you haven't done that, we've got concerts, we've got games, we've got a Glendale history book that will raffle off at the end of the meeting. The bathroom, I was told, is go down the end of the hall, look for the door that says green room. There's a, a single bathroom in there if you need it. Um, also, we have some of these magnets left over, not too many, but from the Heroes Lake opening. My favorite of all time, bulk trash collection. We all need to know when that occurs. And if you did not get one of my newsletters, did everybody get one? If you did not for any reason, would you please see Shannon, who is not here right now. She's guarding, is she here? She's here. Please see Shannon and she'll make sure you get on the list to get one of my newsletters. And there are a few of them on the table. So if you didn't get one, you can pick one up tonight. I'm so glad to see so many people. Wasn't it smart that we decided not to have it on the rooftop? Holy cow. I had a meeting Monday night out by one of the Ramadas by the lake. <clears throat> and by the time the meeting finished, I was like an icicle. It was so cold and windy and just miserable. Another housekeeping. For those of you who haven't had any dinner yet, we've got chicken salad sandwiches and cakes and water. Feel free to get up at any time and help yourselves. This is very casual, very informal. Now at this point, I'm gonna pass the mic because we're being recorded by Facebook. So y'all will be on Facebook tomorrow when we post it. So <clears throat> ladies, straighten out your hair, make sure you've got <laughs> lipstick on. <laughs> and, and I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves. Sylvia Bernardi. Tabitha Mater. Say that loud. Tabitha Mater. All right. Roland Model. Nice to meet you. Might as well get yeah, you Yeah, Sergeant John Rebholz. I'm Commander Nick Sussuris of the Gateway Division. New Command. Hi, I'm Rick St. John, Deputy City Manager. Next row. Nancy Rodriguez. All right. I'm Judy Macko. And I'm Ed Macko. And I know you. Are you still on the Glendale? I am running again. This lady <laughs> is on the Glendale Elementary School Board. Brenda Bartels. Yes. So if you have any issues, <laughs> this is the person you want to oh. talk to. Lisa, Zagar Lisa Zagarella. Craig Zagarella. Sheila Jokowitz. Kathy Bobeck. Gary Bobeck. Bill Jokowitz. One of, now this lady no longer lives in my district. Shh, 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 but, shh. but how's that for <laughs> loyalty? <laughs> Here she is at a Yucca district meeting. Kathy Rowe. Catherine Miskimen. Roberta Miskimen. Levi Miskimen. All right. Rick Myers. Pat Repine. Say that again. Pat Repine. Okay. This guy I know. John Schreiber. John Carter. This guy I know. He calls me to complain a lot. <laughs> Sarah Cunningham. Bill Brunson. Welcome, everyone. It's so nice to have you all here. Uh, tonight, we've got a couple of presentations. And I'm saving time. 
I only limited it to three presentations so that if you have questions about any of them, you'll be able to ask. And if you have any questions about topics that are not being discussed, save them to the end of the meeting. And I or staff will try to answer those as well. Okay? Those are the rules of the game. First up is, I've known him since he was that tall. I've known everybody in the city of Glendale since they were that tall, is Rick St. John. He is a deputy city manager, and he is a person who handles not only the police department, right? Police and fire. Police and fire, but code. He's, he's, he's so mad at me for mentioning that. <clears throat> because if you have any questions about code, this is the gentleman to talk to. And with that, Rick is going to talk about homelessness. Yeah. Because that's a topic that people wonder, we got all that COVID money, what the heck did we do with it? Did we actually spend it on the homeless? So Rick is going to explain what we did. Thank you, council member. Uh, so my name is Rick St. John. I'm a deputy city manager. And, and did the mic cut out, or am I OK? OK. Uh, I, I grew up in the police department here in Glendale, uh, did 23 years in the police department, transitioned over to city management a little less than three years ago. And one of the tasks that was assigned to me by the city manager was uh, homelessness and the, the issues surrounding homelessness. Uh, so we had a multi-departmental task force that was put together from the beginning. Uh, but it was largely ineffective, not because there wasn't a, de a desire to be effective, of course, or we didn't have the right resources. They were having the wrong conversation. So what they were talking about was very police driven. And as the police chief at the time, I was happy with that because it, it gave me a lot of control over what we were doing as a city. But quite frankly, it doesn't work. You can't enforce your way out of a homelessness issue. There has to be other components. There has to be other resources and not-for-profits that are involved that are helping people get off the street. And so when I went into city management, I partnered with a woman named Jean Moreno, who's the director of community services. So she manages all our federal HUD grants uh, and really has a firm grasp on that component that I didn't know a whole lot about as a police chief, and that's the resource component or support services component. And so her and I together have convened an executive task force the Commander Ciceris in his new position will sit on uh, with the Foothills Division Commander and some other folks around the, the city. So we have people from Transportation, uh, Parks and Rec that sit on that. And we really take a holistic look at what's going on with homelessness, some of the national trends, trends in the county. We work with uh, Maricopa Association of Governments on a regional response to what we're doing. And so this presentation, uh, Jean actually put this presentation together. She was she meant to be here tonight, had a family issue that she had to deal with. Uh, we were gonna tag team this, but I'll, I, know the, I know the information. So I'll present it. You guys have any questions, let me know. But I'm gonna run through a couple of slides real quick. So if I can get the first slide up. Pathway Homes is, is Maricopa Association of Governments, their, their regional response to dealing with homelessness. Um, and we're committed to what we call uh, net zero, if you will. So what, what we want is we want the entry into homelessness to be a, a smaller door, if you will, than the exit out of homelessness, because it really is a process that people go through. So as rents increase in Glendale or in the county as a whole, people on fixed incomes are finding it harder and harder to stay in their home. Uh, so we have strategies to help with that, but what it means is more and more people are becoming homeless uh, and we need to stop that. So if we transition five people a week out of homelessness but receive 10 people into homelessness, that's not helping anybody. We need as few as we can going homeless and we need that door of people finding shelter really wide. And so that's net zero. That's what we're trying to do. Other communities across the nation have done it and have had success doing it. So that's our mission as a county. So who are the homeless? This is what was staggering to me. It's this number right here. 30% of our homeless population across the country, and it is true in Glendale as well, are families with kids most often. 
And, and that's staggering to me. And there are a lot of not-for-profits that deal exclusively with families. And we have one of the largest within the city of Glendale. And you'll see on the last slide, or second to last slide, we have a master services agreement. And they are a part of the resources that we use to address uh, families that are homeless. Uh, we just did a point in time count in January uh, where we do a questionnaire ask. So we go out into the community, we talk to the homeless populations, and we do a count, essentially. And we ask a series of questions. And one of those questions is, is this your first time being homeless, number one? And number two, uh, are you a family? Do you have a spouse? Do you have kids that are homeless with you? And the numbers of in Glendale of families that are homeless for the first time was staggering. So we're still vetting those numbers and making sure they're accurate before we publicize them and have a, a conversation with our council in a workshop meeting. Uh, but I think that's going to surprise everybody is this the percent of families that are going homeless. Because uh, when we think of the homeless population, we think drug abuse, we think alcohol abuse, we think mental illness. We don't think mom and dad and kids. But that's the direction things are going for our society and our communities. And so we need, to, we need to address that quickly. Next slide, please. On the national level, this was surprising to me as well. I was in the patrol division in 2007, which is the far left hand of that slide where you can see the homeless issue was actually a bigger problem then than it is today. So we experienced a big downward slope nationally and it's kicking up again. And so who knows what will happen you know, going out to 2030. It may get as high as it was in 2007, may not. Hopefully, some of the strategies we're putting together will keep it from doing that. But if you look in 2007, I, I, I was in the patrol division. You guys probably lived in Glendale at that time. I don't remember it being as bad then as it appears to be now. So that was shocking to me. And I'd love to see that number for Glendale alone. I'd love to see what a Glendale or even a Maricopa County chart looks like. Because this is accounting for everything that's going on all over the country. And we know what's happening in California, Seattle, and other parts of the country where uh, the problem is much worse. And they're having to be more aggressive in strategizing to get people off the street. Um, thank you for advancing the slide. And this is kind of the financial picture of what we've done with, with the CARES Act. So is everybody familiar with what CARES Act is and now American Relief Plan? Uh, what I want to say is the 19 million, the 3.7, and the 300,000, that was not, it had nothing to do with what the city received from the Department of Treasury as far as the ARPA funds and the CARES Act and the restrictions that were placed on us for spending the money. So we got $59.6 million or something like that, two installments uh, of ARPA funds as a city. That's not up here. So those monies are restricted by the Department of Treasury and how the city can spend those monies. They also gave us 19 million in CARES Act ARPA funds, 3.7 in CARES Act funding for initiatives directed directly at homeless. So the government said, you're getting this pot of money to do with what you want under these restrictions and we're giving you this money specifically to address the homeless issue. So. The fact that we have a homeless issue isn't taking money away from what the, the federal government is getting, giving state and local municipalities money to do otherwise. So it's not a tit for tat, if you will. It's not like we would have got 70 million instead of 60 if we didn't have a homeless issue. That's not the way it works. Uh, they separated money at the federal level and then dispersed to the states based on need. Next slide, please. This is the Homeless Services Master Agreement, first in the country that we know of. Um, and we've done a lot of research and we've talked to a lot of people around the country about what we're trying to do here in Glendale. Um, so what we've done is we've said, you know what, we're city government. We know a little about some of the resources that are in the community and we know a little bit about some of the problems that exist in the community and we have money. So we can help pull the right people together, but should we as a government be managing this? Or should we have some uh, higher level oversight and then hire somebody to come in and manage this for us? And that's what we decided to do. So we went out with a request for proposal into the community. We had uh, four different responses. 
and we selected uh, Phoenix Rescue Mission to manage our master services agreement. So Phoenix Rescue Mission has relationship with all these other people, all these other entities to provide all of these services. That's essentially what it means. So Glendale staff not doing this. So we're not spending your money to, to pay for employees that come in and deal with this. We have one staff member that manages a master of services agreement, and we give the money that the federal government gives us through the HUD funds, CDBG, everybody familiar with the community block grants, uh, emergency services grant, and then the last one is called a home grant, but it's essentially new construction grant. So it doesn't really apply to this area unless you're talking about affordable housing, in which case it would apply to some degree. But they're managing this contract for us, which allows us to do the things that we were hired to do originally, uh, which is a benefit to everybody. And they're doing a tremendous job. As you can see, uh, we've had this master services agreement in place since June of last year. Uh, that's when CAS came on. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's when CAS, it's CAS, not Phoenix Rescue Mission, that's, that's running this for us. I don't know where I got Phoenix Rescue Mission from. They're just top of mind, I guess. They're good people. But CAS is managing it. These are the things they're accomplishing within that mass services agreement in, in just the last eight, nine months. So we're seeing a great deal of um, good result coming out of this, but there's a lot more that needs to be done because the homeless population, like I said, is growing, and we need to stop that, and we need to implement strategies that help us to stop that. So that's the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, except to say there are things that we can do as individuals in the community. Uh, one of the things that is very difficult for people, uh, we want to be benevolent. So when we see somebody on the street corner with a sign that says, I have two kids just looking for a little help, it's really hard for us to know if they're being real or if they want money for something different. Um, and it, it, it's just too difficult to make that distinction. So a lot of people, they'll, they'll pack lunches and store them in their car. They'll have money in their car. They'll hand things out. They'll do things to try to help. Um, giving out lunches or clothes or blankets or things like that, no issue with that. Giving money, uh, okay, now we need to start talking about it a little bit because there are groups out there, and the group that, uh, it, hopefully it's up there. I actually don't even see it up there. Oh, Healthy Giving Campaign. So as a region, we've decided that the Healthy Giving Campaign is the direction we want to go. So we have a couple of signs that we've put up in Glendale. And if you've traveled 59th and Glendale or 59th and Northern, you have may you may have noticed these signs that say it's okay to say no to panhandlers. Instead, give your money to Healthy Giving, and Healthy Giving is investing in programs to help feed people and get them off the street. And that's what we want. So we can give them a 20 and feed them for a day, or we can give the healthy giving and hopefully get them off the street permanently into shelter and with warm clothes and food and everything they need. Uh, and it, in my mind, it's the more humane thing to do. You know, um, one of the people that I read about and follow as best I can um, said, you can teach somebody, you can give somebody fish or you can teach them the fish. And that's what we want to do. We want to, we want to get people out of the situation they're in into a healthier situation. And so that's the goal. That's how we're spending our money and our time. Um, with that, I'm going to open it up to any questions anybody has. As the council member mentioned, I am also over code. So if you do have a code question, I'm ha happy to answer that as well. But I'm going to leave your police questions to that guy. Yes. I've been getting like a lot of notices for another person's house that was like a block behind me. Okay. So, and they're like, oh, this is your last warning, this is your fifth warning, whatever. And then I finally went to the city and God was on vacation. And um, I don't know if that record of all those notices to my address. So do you know who the notices were coming from? What notices, that, were they about water or what? Okay, so they were about a violation on the property? Or for a boat parked in the front yard. And a... Do you have a boat in your front yard? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. San Miguel has a boat. Okay. But it's not 7840 San Juan. 
Okay. Yeah, but they sent me like this is your final notice. Yeah. So did you pay it? Uh, my record. <laughs> yeah. After. <laughs> after years, saying, yeah. Don't pay it. <laughs> no, no code compliance problem. Oh, they also said I had a uh, mechanic in my yard doing all this uh, mechanic stuff on my vehicle. Well, all my vehicles are garage. Okay. So probably also San Juan. Oh, it's the same. Yeah, it's it. Or San Miguel, rather. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So is is that like a record for me now? No. Okay. No. Because the way the notes come, you know, the big red letter, you know, this is your final. <laughs> so it it doesn't have your name on it or anything. It just has your address. Uh oh. Can we get a warrant check? <laughs> No, I, 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 you know, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna need to look into that uh, because if, if it has your name on it. A few months ago, it's, it's, it's not, we, we haven't got anything recent. Okay, so maybe it's been corrected. It's been resolved. Of say they moved their boat. Yeah, I thought it, you were good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then I, they would have said, you know, because I was yeah. in the office and the guy was gone and left the name and everything, so it's like nobody. Nobody's talking about it. And, and it's kind of scary because I don't want. Right. Yeah. No, you won't have a record or anything like that. Get all the notices and stuff. Do they like the buying on the town? No. No. So so the way the process works is you get a first notice, a second notice, a final notice, and then we issue a citation. Um, so if you've never received any kind of citation, no, then then you're fine. Oh, okay. No, and I if haven't. you haven't gotten no anything citation. in the last several months, then it's been corrected. Somebody figured the mistake okay. and okay, corrected good. it. <laughs> Yes, sir. I have a question about why did you choose cabs? Because I've ran into some homeless people, homeless vets working stand down. Mm -hmm. And when you mention cast, it's a turnoff. I've talked to a lot of those people that won't go to cast. Now, U.S. vets, they've got a deal on Grand Avenue. and But a lot of people that are homeless, cast is not very popular with them. And uh, what can you do to turn that around to make them more you know, uh, open to talking to somebody from CAS. So, um, and I have heard exactly what you're talking about, but I want to set the record straight on behalf of CAS. So if you, if you go to the second to last slide of the presentation, CAS is, so there's a human services campus in downtown Phoenix, uh, where a lot of homeless, that it's where most of the shelter beds are. And there's an encampment that surrounds it. That's that, is it's just terrible it's a terrible situation and the homeless population they know about that situation and CAS is a part of that campus but it's run by human human services which is not CAS so human services put in for our contract CAS put in for our contract and two other entities put in that were they're just simply too small they they so our finalists were the human services and CAS and when we brought them in and listened to presentations and understood exactly what they've done to this point in our community, um, CAS was the easy decision for us. Uh, because what CAS is doing at the Human Services Campus are what people enjoy. It's all the other stuff that's going on that the homeless don't want to be a part of. And so, but CAS is always blamed for what's occurring. And I got to be honest with you, before we put that RFP out, and got solicitations, I thought CAS and Human Services Campus were the same thing. And I'd been working, so I'd had tours of the campus, I talked to staff members out there, I thought they were all CAS. They're a completely separate 501. Now, are, are we gonna see something in Glendale directly here, rather than them having to go downtown to the Central Arizona Shelter Services Campus. So the focus of Glendale is on veterans and families. So we are uh, engaging with several different companies, uh, construction companies, builders on affordable housing. And we're looking at uh, really three categories, elderly veterans and uh, not elderly veterans, but the elderly veterans and then families. And we're trying to build our um, supply of affordable housing. So we have several different projects throughout Glendale that we're working on with, with different builders and they're all in different phases. Some of them are in design review, some of them have started construction, um, and some of them are just in starting to engage the city in conversation. So that's our focus. And then we're partnering as a region 
so, you know, Peoria, Surprise, Avondale, Goodyear, they all have a piece of this as far as the issues that are occurring in the West Valley. And then Phoenix has a piece of it because of Maryville. Um, and we're engaged on what other cities are going to do. Uh, but as a strategy for Glendale, we decided we're not going to end homelessness. I mean, even the Bible says the homeless are always going to be with you, right? And so we're not going to end it. But what we can do is end families being homeless. We can end veterans being homeless, the elderly being forced out of their homes because of raised rents and fixed incomes. We can end those things. And so that's our focus as a city is to try to end those things. And when we accomplish that, then we can start talking about the drug addicted, the mentally ill, and, and uh, other people that certainly need services, and I don't want to discount them. But our focus is first on what I said. Did I answer the question sufficiently? Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Because they travel, okay, they travel up and down Camelback. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've noticed that they're on the Phoenix side. None are on Glendale side. And they have encampments now. Now they have tents up on 59th, 55th, and even further up. So do you, you know, I, do you work with Maryvale? Because it would be their community, but community action officer? Yes. Okay, so I know these people are on the bottom of the list, but, you know, they do cross over. But, you know, and they, they, you know, they leave all their stuff. Yes, I'll just say stuff. And it's just, you know, I mean, people are walking up and down the sidewalk there. And I mean, the ones, on, the one on 59th, you know, right there, they actually have a tent up. So, I mean, so you're going to not, because they are on the Phoenix side. Mm -hmm. They're not on the Glendale side. What are you going to do with them? I know you're, 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 to me you're saying they're at the bottom of the list. Now, their, their focus, I know, is they don't want to be helped. They want to just tra they travel up and down, camel right. back, get whatever, their drugs, their f whatever. So, so I, that's my problem. That's yeah. my issue. I hate yeah. seeing that. So let me, let me, um, let me restate some things. Um, they're not at the bottom of the list. Uh, they are at the bottom of the list when it comes to what we're building as far as affordable housing. We don't have any design to build a human services campus in Glendale uh, for general population homeless. What we want to do is address families, veterans, and the elderly. Um, and so we're building housing to meet those needs. But we are still very aggressively offering services to everyone. So there's no list for that. We are offering services to everyone. We have the Norton Ramsey Empowerment Center in downtown Glendale now. Um, and what we do is, is we contact people that are at, on, or near Glendale property. So they don't have to be in Glendale. We'll send our team across the street, if you will, to talk to somebody and offer services and try to get them help. Now, what we don't have is any authority to move them. So Phoenix has not granted Glendale officers, for example, any authority to do anything with their homeless population, but our Phoenix Rescue Mission team, and, and I'm saying that correctly, it's not CAS that does outreach, it's Phoenix Rescue Mission and a team of people. And so when they go out, they're contacting, they're offering services. Often we have police officers with them. Sometimes we don't because people don't respond well to police officers, but we have at least some of our officers that are very passionate about it and do a lot of work to help try to get people off the street. So they're learning names, they're having regular conversations with them, and they're trying to encourage them into services. If they accept services, we take them to the empowerment center where they can stay for up to 23 hours. So it's not an overnight facility, but they can stay for 23 hours. They get a shower, they get food, they get clean clothes, they get connected to different resources. We get a medical assistance, dental assistance. Uh, we provide education. So they can go online, earn their GED, anything that they need. Uh, what's amazing to me and that I didn't realize as a police chief that I now realize in my current role, a lot of them have issues because they don't have ID. So we have a team of people that specifically help them get an Arizona state ID. And so that just alone 
you can start to see their mindset change when they realize, wait a minute, I can have a life again. I can get an ID. I can get into affordable housing. I can get a job. Um, and so that's what we're doing with the homeless population, regardless of whether they're elderly, veteran, or a family. Right. So I'm hearing you right. You're not going to have a camp like you do on Jefferson. Correct. Okay. Correct. So there is a bill going through legislation right now. Uh, it's a bill to establish camps, true camps. Uh, so one of our legislators here in the West Valley is, is supporting this bill and proposed this bill. Um, there's a lot of conversation going on around it. And the idea is if people are going to camp because there's not enough shelter and not enough housing, then let's build an area where they can camp and be safe, where there's where there are public restrooms they can use, there's facilities, there's uh, the benevolent groups that are in every community, the churches that want to feed and, and do those kinds of things. Instead of doing it at Bonzel or at your new Heroes Park, do it at this campus that we've established. So there's a lot of merit to the idea. I'm not fully sold on it, I'll tell you that. But there's some, I, I do understand what this legislator is trying to do. Uh, and there are people that live the lifestyle by choice. So the drug addicted, the alcohol addicted, they don't want to be told what they can and can't do. They want to do what they want to do. And in a camp like this, provided they're not breaking any laws, they can still live out of a tent or whatever. And, and, and there would be shelters there. So it wouldn't be cardboard boxes or, or stolen property from a construction site. Um, we would actually have tents set up with restrooms and things like that. Um, I, I don't know if any cities are going to buy into it. I don't know if the county's going to buy into it, but he's asking for a significant number of state funds to go towards this idea. And we'll kind of have to see how that plays out. Um, but as far as any conversation that we've had with our elected officials, I'm not hearing any desire to bring anything like that in today. Now that obviously elected officials have conversations and, and make decisions based on current needs. And so I'm not saying it will never happen, but there's no plan for it today. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, council members talking about the Glendale works program. So what we started, uh, several years ago now, we had we partnered with Phoenix Rescue Mission. We have a, a big 12-person passenger van. Um, people that are homeless can come and work a four-hour shift, and then we pay them for the four-hour shift they work. And they do things like clean our right-of-way. Uh, there's some work that they do out at our landfill that's just basic labor. So we transport them to the job site. They work for four hours. We bring them back. We feed them. We offer resources. We try to get them off the street. Uh, and then we pay them and, and they move on. And we've seen a great deal of success with people that keep coming back. We establish and build a relationship and they eventually decide this is better than what I was doing before. I'm feeling good about myself. I'm working, I'm contributing, I'm getting paid for it. I'm getting a hot meal and I want this full time now. And so we've seen a lot of people go through that program and end up in uh, affordable housing in a secure environment and getting full-time jobs. And one of the things that we're talking about, city, the city of Glendale has a ton of different contracts for a ton of different reasons. I'm sure everybody's aware of that. And so we hire people to maintain our parks, to maintain our right-of-ways. We have our own staff that does some of it, but it's just too much work. And so we have to hire outside contractors to come in and do it. And one of the things we're talking about is building into those contracts that they have to hire through Glendale Works and if we have people in Glendale Works that can do the job full time, that they need priority in their hiring list. And with the uh, employee population being what it is today. So I was talking to a fire chief uh, just before this meeting who told me they are struggling to hire EMTs for ambulance services. And that used to be a job that if you put out an application, you got a thousand people that wanted to apply. To just to try to get their foot in the door and get on with the fire department. And now we constantly hire. We don't ever stop hiring because we can't get good candidates in. 
And if we do get a good candidate after a year, we hire them as a firefighter and they're no longer riding the ambulance. So, which is, that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's a career path, but we have to keep the ambulances running, right? And so, I mean, the job market today is just ridiculous. In fact, I was talking to, I've got adult kids and I was talking to one of my sons who's an adult and telling him, you don't even have to be good at what you do anymore. You just have to be willing to do it <laughs> and you're going to have success. You're going to find work. You're going to have success. I mean, that's just where we are in today's society. So hopefully that changes. Can I jump in real fast? If you have a question, we are putting this on Facebook tomorrow. So if you don't have a microphone, they won't hear the question. So that's why I'm asking you if you have a question, I'll hand you the mic. And if you could use it, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. And my time is probably up. I know there's other presentations, but uh, if you have any other questions or anything like that, um, filter them through the council member, through Shannon, and I'm happy to communicate with you. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Rick did a good job. He always does. He's been around a long time. He knows what to say. But when he brought up that idea of some legislator wanting to promote camps, that's the stupidest idea I ever heard of. That, uh, well, I am. Uh, that's shades of she Seattle, San Francisco. I don't want that replicated in the Valley. That's, that's a dumb idea. And I'll bet you it's the same legislator who tried to pass a bill to present, preempt every city's zoning laws so that we could build affordable housing, affordable housing everywhere, and that cities would not be able to stop it. So even if you were in, for example, um, a residential area zoned, SR-17 or R-16, and there's a vacant piece of parcel in that area, this legislator wanted to allow developers to come in without any approval from the city, and they could put multifamily on that parcel, right in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Dumbest thing I ever heard of. Well, he got a lot of pushback from every city, so now he's, he's withdrawn the bill and uh, is studying it, and that's probably all it deserves. So it sounds like the same guy is now pushing homeless camps. Crazy, crazy. All right, next up is police department to talk about your favorite subject, street racing. We all love street racing, but I, I will tell you I was pretty impressed with some of the information he was sharing. So I'm going to invite Commander Nick Sasaurus. Did I say that right? He's a newbie. He's only been Gateway Commander for three days, so go easy on him. <laughs> All right? And he's got with him Sergeant John Revels, who is a motor officer. Those people that you love to hate, the motors that stop you for speeding or with when your tail lights out or whatever. Uh, I wave at them when I go by them. Uh, so, so these two gentlemen are gonna share everything they know about street racing. Nick, it's all yours. Thank you, ma'am. Um, as she said, my name's Nick Sassurus. Um I've been with the city of Glendale for 28 years sworn. Uh, I just got promoted to commander. I've literally just moved my office. So obviously I have a, to you. oh, sorry. I usually talk so loud that I don't need it, but <clears throat> uh, so I literally just moved my office. Um, I'm new, but I will tell you again, I've been here for 28 years. Um, I don't want to bore you with all my stuff, but I've been in investigations for half my career. I worked a gang unit, state gang task force. I was assigned to ATF, worked the Hells Angels investigation, uh, came back, was promoted. I did patrol. I just came out of uh, investigations. I was a lieutenant over homicide for the last uh, year and a half and then I got promoted. So even though I, um, you, guys can, you guys can beat me up if you need to. Um, I'm a big guy, I can take it. <laughs> or you can try anyways, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so I will tell you that uh, before I even left patrol to go to investigations, I was actually a uh, swing shift lieutenant and I had the whole city. I worked uh, two to midnight and I worked with uh, a Phoenix uh, lieutenant down there on street racers because we were starting to have them show up here and they were showing up at Westgate and 
trying to take over the parking lots and we'd literally get 30 officers from Phoenix and Glendale and we'd line up, turn our lights and sirens on and chase them out of the city. Obviously that's grown into what you guys see on the news. Um, I'm not, I don't, I have the numbers, but I'm going to let the Sarge here uh, refer those to you and, and some of the things that we've done over the last several months um, to combat this. I almost hate to say this, but with gas at $5 a gallon, it's probably going to have a temporary solution to slow this down a little bit. And I was even telling her tires, I could not believe I looked at tires like two years ago. I was 175 bucks. I looked them up. The cheapest I could find was like 350 389 I was like, so um, do you guys have anything for me real quick before I hand the mic over to the Sarge and let him give you the statistics on the street racers? I will see you guys a lot. Um, I look forward to working with you. We're here for you guys, okay? Um, I just ask that you guys help us out, and you got to call. You got you to let us know what's going on, and I'll tell you, I get about 150 emails a day, literally, and half of them are, you know, not complaints, but concerns from you guys that are coming in and uh, dovetailing off what the district city, ma uh, city manager was just talking about. A majority of our calls are homelessness and I will tell you I've been just in the last three days I've been talking to my cat team and we we've created a book um, which is if you held it from the floor about that thick of everybody that we deal with and it is difficult because I will tell you a lot of these ones not the families not the elderly not the veterans a majority of these folks that are out here they don't want help they're they're happy living the way they are um, a lot of them have drug dependencies, alcohol issues, most of them are drugs. Um, it's not good uh, and it's very difficult, but we are moving these folks on. I was just telling uh, the city, <laughs> district city manager that there was uh, over by the Taco Bell 4400, um, the KFC and the Taco Bell 4400 Glendale, they're building apartments and the homeless had set up a camp and they had gone in and stole two by fours and wow all this stuff and they literally built a little, their own little condo if you will um, there was seven of them, seven or eight of them living in it uh, we were able to call the workers over and they were able to reclaim their stolen property their wood and lumber and pipe and Lord only knows what else they had in there um, and get those folks to move on I will tell you talking to my folks one in six might actually want help that, that are willing to actually go to a shelter uh, we even uh, met with folks at uh, the park the other day and we actually had folks with us that would help them right then and there, not one person took it. So wow. it, it is not going to be easy, but like, just so you guys are aware, we are working it and we will continue to work it and do the best that we can. A question, if we, if we see somebody doing a wheelie or whatever, score, whatever, and you want a license plate, you want the make of the car, what do you need? Anything? You know what I mean? So, so he is a, yeah, so, so it's going to be difficult. And um, if you, were you guys watching the news was it three, four weeks ago where they had the incident in Scottsdale? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. so if you're not aware, if you, if you didn't listen to the whole thing, somebody tried to be a good citizen and take video and get them to stop, and they actually followed him home and shot at him. Oh. So these, a lot of these kids that are doing this stuff, yeah, the ones that have been arrested all have drugs. They're all armed. Um, there's a lot of issues. Okay, so... I would suggest to you, as I would anything else, be a good observer. Yeah. And if you happen to get something, the only thing with that is, if you see somebody pop a wheelie, I'm going to be honest with you. I was driving down the freeway the other day, driving home, and it's, um, yes, it's an unmarked car. There's a guy riding a wheelie for about five miles up the freeway oh, on a motorcycle really? in the HOV lane. Wow. Um, I think uh, I'm talking about mostly doing spin outs. And okay, stuff so, like that, you know yeah, I mean? so I will tell you if you have the ability to get something safely, by all means, all right. okay. A plate but number don't. Maybe, or a car yeah, a or plate or number, a description, a video, yeah, photo. Th but I'm going to be honest with you. It is happening so much, and the risk to you guys is probably greater than it is worth risking getting a photo. Because if these guys see that, you're going to have what happened in. You potentially could have happen what happened in Scottsdale. Right. They literally followed this guy home for a couple miles and then cranked off a bunch of rounds. This happened Thanks. right in front of our house. Yeah, right. Yes. In the cul-de-sac. And, and, so, and, and if you guys it. have ring cameras, if you okay. have, 
cameras yeah. if yeah. you have that kind of stuff yeah we do my guys would love to have that stuff right, hopefully good. it'll be good enough that we can capture something yeah. off of that but absolutely All right. okay. but don't put yourself at risk yeah, I mean, don't run out there hey yeah, what are you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't stay in your house call us let us come do it All right, thanks a lot good. anybody else oh, you guys are too easy yeah. <laughs> all right last chance all right sergeant johnny rebels thanks commander and congratulations uh Thank you, council member, for letting us be here. So uh, I, I'll probably just start off real quick with, uh, probably because I deal with calls. Um, I'll let you know, I've been here 19 years. I was a detective, uh, promoted a little over two years ago to sergeant, was in patrol. Uh, we have our traffic unit, which is comprised of uh, a couple traffic officers, our investigators that do the fatalities. Uh, the motor officers and uh, they put out an opening uh, for a motor sergeant to ride a motorcycle there's three and they didn't have any interest it's kind of one of those occupational things that's changing uh, just officers don't want to ride motorcycles generations have changed so they couldn't find anybody they opened it up to a, a car or motorcycle position and at that point I put in so I technically don't ride a motorcycle but I supervise officers that do I work with the two other sergeants that ride motorcycles and, and the officers that do. Uh, I, I deal with the speed racers because I've been working the night shift, and that's primarily when they're out and about. Um, <clears throat> we had an issue probably back when he was a lieutenant or before, it was like 2019, and Glendale addressed it relatively quickly, and it went away. Uh, they, they went to Phoenix. Um, this issue's all across the country. Uh, it's really bad in California and the tactics and the things they're do using is just, it's really kind of scary to be honest. Um, and I can say that because I went to the governor's office of highway safety. There was a seminar uh, back about six months ago. If you're not familiar, it's uh, governor's office of highway safety. I think assistant city manager was wearing a shirt. It's the run by the governor's office and they get federal highway funds, they get state funds, and they distribute millions of dollars to local police. That's where we get our grant money to do DUI enforcement, uh, occupant enforcement, so people not wearing seat belts, pedestrian enforcement, and we also get what they call a step grant. It's grant money that goes to the city to do aggressive driving enforcement. So what happens is officers are allowed to work that. Uh, usually it's overtime money, and their specific goal is within that grant to go out and address those issues. So uh, we went to that s seminar, uh, 500 police officers in the state, and Phoenix PD uh, has an actual task force that deals with street racing. It started in February 2020, and they're the experts on it. Um, so they spoke. We didn't have an issue. Uh, I was in the unit. They built a new building, if you're familiar, out on Glendale, just over New River. Uh, so as you go over the, the actual wash area, New River, to the right, it's like 11550. It's a corporate building. Nobody's in it yet. But they for some reason found out it's an empty parking lot back there and they started going back there and doing their spin outs uh, that was the first thing we had uh, so what we did we got with our cat team got a trespassing found out who the owners were our, our cat team if you're familiar with our cat team members uh, we have a blanket trespass so it gives us an authorization to arrest somebody if they don't leave for the property and they're putting up signs I knew it was going to be an issue right then, so I reached out. I just had a feeling, and of course, it, it, it happened like overnight. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about probably some of your complaints about noise. There, some of the, the, we're dealing with two separate things in a, in a sense. Uh, we'll talk about street racers first. So I reached out to that sergeant in Phoenix. He immediately called me, like immediately from my email, and said, yeah, I know they're in Glendale, and basically went to tell me that um, – they, they've been watching the street racing crews, and they did such good enforcement in Phoenix and all over uh, that they generated their way back to Glendale. And it, it could be for a couple reasons. Uh, out west here, we have a lot of these big buildings, big parking lots, um, Westgate's an enter entertainment area, and they probably didn't feel comfortable in Phoenix or Mesa or wherever it be. So he said he named three places, the Bank of America building downtown, Heroes Park, and uh, that building out at 115th. So I set up to meet with them. Basically, long story short, we're collaborating with them. Um, so we're in contact with them. 
our patrol sergeants on night and that are in contact with them. And they're giving us intelligence uh, of where these, these groups are. Very, very, very sophisticated at this point. Um, on, almost like something you'd see on TV with drug dealers. They're communicating via these text apps and they're using the emojis as words. So um, it's very hard to find them until they do what they uh, do a uh, intersection takeover. And that's what happened shortly later. So you, it's, to break it down, there's a, a couple different groups. So what you're seeing out there is they're side-by-side -side racing. Those are the groups that will meet up and they have this whole way they do it. Um, those were some of the groups that were meeting at Heroes Park, cars and trucks. And what they were doing, he said, and we, we learned a lot of information from them, and we, we wouldn't have known. What they're doing is they'll have the 50 cars in Heroes Park, and then four or five will leave the park. You just think they're leaving. What they do is they'll go down Cardinal's Way, Glendale Avenue, he said. They were watching them, and then they will start a, a race, basically. Wait till the roadway's clear, and then two will race. Those are the most ex most dangerous he says and they have videos of the bad wrecks they have side-by-side -side racers are very very dangerous because they get ex super high speeds so you have the side-by-side -side racing and that's a little bit different those people in that those car clubs and truck clubs than the ones that take over the intersection and do the donuts like you've seen on tv but so it's almost like a different culture within this street culture so uh, it's very interesting the street takeovers, they, he said they weren't doing them forever, um, for a while. They cracked down on them. I had them come out to do training for about 30 of our sergeants, a bunch of our lieutenants, about a month and a half ago. And then that's, he said, we're not having them. The next week is when they started doing the intersection takeovers, just out of the blue. They did 63rd and Bell. They were doing them all over the valley. Uh, Phoenix has enough officers that they'll go around the valley and work it um, their police chief and their commander allow them to come into other jurisdictions to help as long as there's cooperation so i've been the collaboration with them we've we'll they can go wherever they want a police officer can enforce laws anywhere in the state when they cite somebody they have to cite into the right court so they were doing some sites here in Glendale, and they were citing not into our city court, but to the justice court. Um, so when we worked it out, and we're going to work it out here, where they may start if their 14 officers and their sergeant follow these groups, and they get somebody in Glendale, they may start citing them into our Glendale city court, which may bring revenue to our city. But um, that's just kind of a side point. So it's just working with them. We're working with them. We don't have the resources they do. They have 14 people slotted to work this, and they go over the entire valley. They've been as far out as Florence following these groups. There's a big cement slab out there that they go over and take over. They use everything from their helicopter to their airplanes to follow them. So we're working on it, um, and we're just staying in touch with it. He called me one night. I went out to Maryland in 95th, so or 99th, I'm sorry, 99th in Maryland, and they had taken over the intersection. And I got out there, they started to surround my car. And so I, I was able to get out, um, but in the past a couple of years ago, they've broken windows of police cars and stuff like that. So if, if you're caught up in that, most of you probably aren't out too late, although they've been, they've been out as early as 7 in the evening, uh, but usually it's later. If you're caught up in it, try to do a U-turn, go the other way. I've told my wife and daughter the same thing because they're all over the valley. Um, they, they've, they'll just stand in front of the cars. They'll have cars turn on their flashers, and they'll, so they'll stop traffic at all four, and then they'll just take it over, and you're just stuck in a traffic jam. Uh, but if you can get out, turn around, don't confront them, something like that. Um, usually we, you know, we'll get out there. Uh, they'll flee. Um, that one, Phoenix, came in. I put on my lights. They eventually left. And then they go all over. So that day they went all around the valley. The Scottsdale incident, the shooting, they had another incident. They smashed in some good, good Samaritan, good citizen uh, windshield. They were all over the valley. They made arrest in Mesa for another shooting. They went all over. And I think when they went out to Glen Harbor, he believes that they were the same groups. Um, 
um, mm -hmm. you know, we cleared the way. Um, we have the advantage here in Glendale, if you haven't heard about it, we have our real-time crime center, which can tap into our traffic cameras if there's a crime in progress. So it's strictly used for if there's a crime or something happened, we, that's monitored at times when there's somebody up there. So we can get video evidence um, if we know there was a crime like that, them taking over the intersection, damaging somebody's car, doing something like that, and we can use that. So I've shared some of that evidence with them, referenced the incident when I went out, they surrounded my car because they, they think they know who some of those people were that did that, and they're gonna follow up on it. They're just getting more savvy in that incident. They, they cover their license plates. Um, they have, you know, they're doing everything to be avoided. Um, and they're getting, now they're using lasers and pointing them at officers, so. Um, so we're, we're dealing with it, we're working with them. Um, it's an ongoing thing and hopefully we can, we can get them out of here. We're addressing the issue at the Bank of America that is city owned building. They do go there. Um, there you have, and again, it's, it's, you can't put everybody in the same group. You have people that just go up there to look at the stars. You have just regular people. You have the clubs to go and hang out. And then you do have the occasional ones up there who do the donuts and stuff up there. So we're going to try to address that to see where we get the proper signage, maybe shut that down. That's working with the facilities department in the city, and that's an ongoing issue. So if anybody lives over there and hears about that, um, it's, it's being addressed. We're working on it. Um, the other issue would just be the noise, and I think maybe some of you have went through Glendale 1. We call Q Alert. It's the same program. Um, I would say the history out here in the west side, it's been 91st Avenue. So they come from Phoenix, northbound 91st to go to Westgate. Wednesday night, they hang out at Dutch Brothers. It's a kid hangout, trucks and car clubs. Uh, my motor officers have been working that. They, they work it as much as they can work it. Um, I have three. We were also working north side. They were doing a project called Silent Night for the Barrel District because they had problems up at 59th. So um, they're kind of torn. Two would be down here, one would be up there. Sometimes all three would be down here. Some would go up there. So because uh, it's not just here. So, uh, but really good job on 91st. I'll even sit out there. I watch them now. They drive slow to go to Westgate because they know we're out there and they're going to get tickets tow their cars but I think what led what happened was they kind of generated an 83rd so who's ever here on 83rd um, I know there was some concerns I want the council member I think that's what happens they yeah they, they I think they I think they just adapt they know we're on 91st doing enforcement so on that I'll speak about that once we got that on the fifth I think it was the email we jumped on that um, it wasn't just the motors, it was really a good effort with our patrol division. Lieutenant Cooper works nights and the sergeant really took uh, vested interest in it. So it was like the first 14 days, I think there was 101 stops. Um, and now when they're stopping, I think I'll answer for myself. I'm pretty sure patrol is the same. At night, I'm not stopping anybody till it's 15 over, 15 over. That's how many people are speeding. The average person, if you go out with me and my, my radar, we go on Bell Road and it's not bumper to bumper, average person is doing 47 to 48 and a 40. Everybody's doing seven to eight over. You might all be doing 40, they're all doing 48, maybe 50. So that's just things have changed in, since COVID. So 15, it sounds like crazy. Oh, you stop them when they're, they're speeding at 50. You want to stop them at 50. Well, there's so many that are doing 55 plus you want to get the because speed kills, and that's it. Really, really, really kills the higher the speed. So we're picking them off. These these hundred stops were probably speed limits forty. They're probably fifty five plus. They might have picked off some at fifty, but they're going for the speeders. Those are the ones that are making the noise. Those are the ones that are going to hurt us, and all of us out there. So, and then um, it was we just continued on. So I think that first we had a. Our documentation purposes, we went through a new system. So the officers on their phone will just go into a program and say they made a stop. Our documentation, we went to kind of a flipped over to a new link. So we lost some numbers in the middle of the end of January uh, into February. But it was in the, in the end through March, it was like 153 stops, you know, um, 32 sites. And 
those are criminal speed sites. I know people were physically arrested. So in Arizona, if you're not familiar, technically, anything 20 miles an hour over the posted speed limit in a business or residential area is criminal speed, which means you can be physically arrested, you can be given a criminal site, uh, and appear in court. So the, there's been physical arrest of people. And off, the officers are fed up with it too. I mean, we're out there doing traffic stops, doing accidents, and, and they're whizzing right by us, you know. And I, I just pray, I pray every night that our officers or anybody out standing out there, tow truck drivers aren't getting hit because it, they're, people are just uh, driving too fast. So the other thing that came about was in August, we changed our city ordinance. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Uh, they uh, amended our city ordinance for uh, ve vehicular noise. And they basically said if anybody modifies their exhaust on their vehicle, um, any modification, it's the first fine's $100, second's gonna be 500, and then the third, if you were to get a third in a, a year, which would probably be hard to get stopped three times in a year, but if you did, it's a, it's a criminal offense. So that was somewhat new in August, I don't think, Everybody knew about it. January, the North Side, we, uh, Commander Horrell, who works the North Side, uh, brought it up and they started enforcing it. We, I sent out a thing to our legal advisor, had him look at it. Um, obviously, it's good. It, it passed city ordinance, so it's a city law. Uh, but we talked about how are we going to present this to a judge. And, and that first month, I think we had 30 sites for it. So, And I don't have anything from February to March, but I know as a traffic unit, the rest of the patrol, they look to us because, you know, our guys are the traffic experts. So they come to us and ask questions, just like you'd go to, um, you know, a homicide lieutenant or sergeant if you, if you had a question. And they were asking us about it. And now that they know about it, they're citing for it too. So they're going up to, you know, you stop a car, the exhaust is loud. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, there's not a decibel level in the city ordinance, so that's where some officers were a little concerned about it. We talked to our legal advisor. So it's just documenting it. Um, these things, body-worn cameras are great. I'll go up to the car. It's so loud, I'll have to ask them to shut it off. And when they shut it off, or if I can't hear them, you know, I could play this in court to a judge and say, I issued that citation, you know, if they fight it, which they're not going to usually fight the 100, but they'll fight the 500 and say, you know, let the judge listen to it. And, but what, to get them, it's just like anything. You walk up the car, my guys will go, oh, that's cool. What kind of exhaust do you have? What would you do? And they'll say they modified it. They put a you know, cat back or whatever. And once they say that, they pretty much admitted that they modified their, their exhaust system to their Ford or their Camaro or whatever it was. So um, there isn't, but we've talked about that. Um, there's agencies in other states that actually have these really cool, kind of expensive, uh, decibel meters and what they'll do is they'll stand behind the vehicle take three different measurements and they'll actually use that in court so that's something that we may look into uh, not cheap they're like 500 bucks but I mean if we can start to get that because that is a concern for everybody I mean I, where I live in North Peoria I mean I live a quarter mile from the street and with the windows open it's it's extremely loud there it's, it's just everywhere the proliferations uh, been that way so it's going to take some enforcement it's not just going to be glendale it's going to have to be statewide or they're going to have to know hey we can't be ripping around glendale because they're going to start giving these citations out so so we're working on that and um let's see what else we have i think that was it i think that was it like just in in general i think that came up from from uh your email that we addressed it. So, oh, real quick. And so I talked to the lieutenant, and he's saying he has to sit out there now 20 minutes at 83rd and Cardinal's Way before they're really getting somebody speeding. So the effect has been there. Hopefully it stays. If it comes back, they're going to they're gonna stay on it. Um, and then, you know, hope they may go back to 91st, and we'll go back there. Uh, but um, if they know, it's just like anything. If they know that we're there, hopefully that changes their behavior. That's what we want. We don't want the noise for you. Yes, sir. Another question. I mean, a lot wait, wait. We need to get the mic to you first. Oh. Go ahead. Basically, I was just going to say a lot of the noise tends to come down Camelback from 83rd Avenue, 75th, and even further back and forth, west and east. So, um, you know, at 
two o'clock in the morning, that sound can be coming from anywhere. And part of the reason I ask about the decibel levels because depending on what it is and where it is, you know, I mean, that, that's what people are thinking are, is happening is speed racing. When I've seen plenty of cars going up and down by Heroes and they're doing 40 miles an hour, but their exhaust is extremely loud. So there's where a lot of confusion on Nextdoor app. They're putting out their car racers and people are upset. I can understand that. So that's kind of what I was asking for clarification. And being that Camelback corridor there is being that that's Phoenix on the south side and Glendale there, who's in charge and who patrols that? So Camelback is our jurisdiction. So any enforcement in Camelback is ours. You're 100% correct in what you say. So if you were to, any of you were to go out with me, we go sit at 91st and San Juan, which is south of Montebello, which is kind of near the county island, but still Glendale there. And you'll hear it. And it's on the 101. So we are we are at 91st. That's one almost one mile to 99th, shy of a mile, about almost. And exactly what you said. And I'll sit out. Some of these streets will sit with the lidar, you know, the laser, and I'll hear it because you know, when you have to testify in court, you have to say, uh, you can't just say, oh, on my radar, I got him. You have to say, I visually saw it you know i mean that should be your first thing is so you testify i visually saw a red truck that appeared to be going with estimated you know post a speed limit then i put my laser or my radar on it and saw that it was in excess and i locked it in at you know 73 and a 40. so sometimes i'll be out there and i'll hear it and i'll be like oh they're cruising and you look and they're doing like 23. it's just that muffler literally like and you if you if you see sometimes so um, if you get them with the speed and then that exhaust is loud, you can, you can cite for it. So we're going to see. We're going to see if people start fighting them in the city court. Um, I, for $100, I think a lot of them, they have nice cars. A lot, of, a lot of them work. The kids, I don't know how they afford it. They have nicer cars than most of us. Yeah. But, um, you know, $100 is going to cost them. They're going to probably know to hopefully slow down and uh, that. But, yeah, you're correct. And so Camelback's ours. Everything north is Glendale. Question. You guys are talking about decibels for the street racers. What about the music? Uh, is there anything on the music that you can enforce? The mu well, we have a city ordinance about music, so um, it's off property. A lot of it detail it's specific to homes, but it's also to cars. So you you could do um, you could you could do like a disorderly conduct. Um, even with the exhaust, we talked to our city prosecutor a few months ago, uh, and he said if we can articulate that it's, it's that loud, that we can technically do, uh, 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 which is unreasonable noise, uh, it's a misdemeanor. It's not; It doesn't fall under a traffic statute, but we, we could, it would be like somebody blasting their stereo. So, um, yeah, um, I, I don't, I, I don't, being out there, I don't hear Sometimes I hear it, but not as much as I did years ago. It's it's the it's the mufflers. Uh, they're just they're so loud, and sometimes it's um, when when they're just right before they take off from that initial. So they're not speeding or anything, but it's just loud. So, any other questions? Nothing else. So uh, we take your concerns seriously. Use Glendale One. Um, officers are passionate about it. We're doing the most we can, and we're working with Phoenix, so uh, we, we don't want any of it around here. So yeah, you're not the the only people. It's it's a, there might be hope. Maybe at the state level, they might start some type of task force uh, where it's not just a task force where it's multiple agencies dealing with this. There's been there's been some new laws where we can tow their cars for 20 days now. Uh, but they're getting smart with that. They'll put their car in their girlfriend's name or their, their mom's name. So the first time they'll end up getting it back right away, it won't hold for 20 days. And, but if it is held for 20 days, it's, it's almost $1,000 or more just to get it out. So that's an effect that's, that ho hopefully works. Yes, sir. So my question is for the Glendale One app, how does that communication go to the police department because i mean there's things that go through that app for code and yeah for everything else so how is that information relayed out to you so so how it works for us to answer your question uh it, it's automatic the way it's programmed it will know if it's a um say it's a racing issue you have the drop down menu it says racing it will automatically generate it to our department representative so officer schlingman is the traffic enforcement officer he oversees 
the PD part. He was one of the first people in the city to, to work with the program. And so what he'll do is he'll go through. He's excellent at it. He he knows everything about it, and he'll assign it to the appropriate people. Um, so that's how it kind of works. If you were to go in, I used to use it as an officer. When I was in patrol before I promoted, I was working 6-1 in Bethany. When it first came out, I put it on my phone. They were dumping tires over there. <laughs> I, I've used I my name's in that system as a police officer because it was quicker than me calling a department or sending emails. So I'd go on Glendale one, boom, a bunch of four or five tires dumped at 61st and Solano, and I would put it in. I put my PD number, and then I, I would say I didn't want contact, and that the, they, they would pick it up or the couches they were dumping, and then the street lights were out, and so I would put in the street lights and get them repaired. Uh, it's it's a very if you all used it, it's a great system. I to speak to that. Glendale One is very good for non-emotional issues. If you've got a pothole or a street light out, um, technical things, they jump on them right away and the department is mandated to take care of it within, I think, 72 hours or it bumps up to the city manager's office. And none of them want to be bumped up to the city manager's office. It's the emotional things. The neighbor with the barking dog, or the neighbor with a pile of crap in their driveway. Those are people who live next to those things. It's like salt, rubbing salt in a wound, because you see it every day, and it makes you more and more angry. Those are the issues that are not really good for Glendale One. And as much as staff probably wouldn't like me saying this, what I would say is contact your council member. In this case, it's me. Uh, and, and let me get a hold of a, the appropriate department heads and work the issue that way. Um, but only on the emotional things. The technical things like the street light or the pothole go through Glendale One. It's a great app for those. Any other questions for the sergeant? Thank you. He did, they did a good job. He did a good job. I learned more about street racing than perhaps I ever wanted to know. But he did do a very good job. Um, and I was impressed with all those arrests, or sites, right? The stops, both were. The stops, 150 stops? Yeah, over 150. 150. He says probably closer to 200 stops. So they're doing it, but it's like sludge. You know how when you put your hand over sludge and it oozes through your fingers or goes around your hand? That's what this street racing is like. We, we get rid of them in one spot in Glendale, they move to Phoenix or Avondale or Surprise. And then when they get caught there, they move to another lo location. So it's, it's a never-ending situation. And I would say the best thing to do, really, on street racing, if you notice a lot of street racing, for example, I told a, a constituent called me about Heroes Park, and I notified you all about that, and they got on it right away. So if it's something like street racing, maybe you better let me know, and I can, I can interface with the PD about that, okay? Next up, water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. No, we've got plenty of water to drink. But we've got some great people who live, eat, and breathe water. And, and I would say this, all the people that I bring forward to these meetings, these Glendale employees, I've known a lot of them for years, 10 years, 20 years, these people love Glendale, and they work their butts off to make Glendale as good as it can possibly be. Now, I'm going to say something that's not politically correct. Not everybody is competent. They may love Glendale, but some people are not so competent. So they're trying their best, but they're not very good at it. But 95% but of those employees who work in Glendale are number one employees. They really do love Glendale and try to make Glendale better. Now, having said that, 
I have three people in the water department, all of whom want to make sure that you always have plenty of water, whether there's a drought or not. And I'm going to introduce them. They're all going to take a different portion of the water issue. Joanne Toms is going to talk about drought management. Drew Swikowski, did I get that good, pretty close? Very good. That, that's my Polish background. Uh, Drew is going to talk about Glendale's water resources, and Megan Sheldon is here to answer any follow-up questions. And, and again, I would remind you, if you've got a question after their presentation, raise your hand so that Mike can get the mic. That's alliteration. So that Mike can get the mic to you. Otherwise, the people who are watching in Facebook will not have a clue as to what you asked. And we'll start with Drew, right? Yes, thank you. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome tonight. Uh, my name is Drew Swiskowski. I am the water resource manager for Glendale. I've been in Glendale for about seven years, and before that I was a hydrologist with the Department of Water Resources for about 25 years, which is weird because I'm only like, you know, 35, so I don't, I don't really know how that happened. But uh, tonight we're going to cover a couple things, just our basic water resources, some drought conditions I'm sure you've all heard about. Salt River Project Supplies, this is our, our SRP supplies, Colorado River Supplies, tell you that Glendale is prepared for the shortage. Uh, and then Joanne Toms will be talking about our drought management plan and also water conservation program. So um, just really quick, uh, Glendale's water resources, as you know, we have Colorado River water, CAP water. We have Salt River Project water. Uh, which comes in our canal, which in parts of the city. We have groundwater and then we have effluent. We use all of these one source throughout the whole city. We don't try to divide this up because a shortage in one means a shortage for all. So and we really do use these water sources throughout the entire city. So as you've probably heard, the Southwest drought has been ongoing for the last 22 years. That's a long time. Now that doesn't mean it's been completely dry because during the drought sometimes you have really good precipitation, sometimes you have good snow, but generally what a drought means is that you have lower precipitation than normal for a, uh, for a long duration of time. And that's what we've had, 22 years, that's amazing. Now that, there are some studies that have shown that we've had drought even longer. Uh, we're anticipating uh, probably this drought will still continue and I'll show you some, some pictures in, in a little bit. Um, you can see all the titles here, you know, drought expected to persist in much of the western U.S. Be beyond 2022. There's a lot of bad news out there. Uh, you know, you can see it anytime you, you turn on the, on the news. You know, Lake Mead is going down, Lake Powell, what's happening to our water? So I'll try to explain some of that tonight for you also. So some drought conditions in the west. Uh, the red here and the, and the increasing colors as we go down means there's more intense drought. Where we're really looking, this is Arizona here. We have Colorado, some of the upper basins. What really matters is where the snow falls, where that then snow turns into runoff, goes into the Colorado River, and then comes into our reservoirs like Mead and Lake Powell. And as you can see, it's pretty dry out there. We haven't had a really good winter. We've had a little below average. Uh, it's going to take a lot more than that. Um, for the next slide, we see Arizona. Uh, this has gotten a lot worse. This is uh, from March 1st. You can see the yellow. As again, we get more red, it shows more drought conditions. And that's just kind of the soil moisture, kind of what we're seeing out in the field. So when you see this red, it's pretty dry. And when you see here, this is abnormally dry. Not bad. We've gotten some rain. Of course, we had a great monsoon. So that really helped us uh, with this past summer as we go. And we're hoping for a good monsoon this year, too. So. Um, some of the, I just wanted to show you a seasonal temperature outlook, and this is from April to June for this year. As you can see, we're seeing temperatures above normal, both in Arizona and kind of in the western United States. That's not good for, for precip because it dries things out. When you look at, was that, were those temperatures? Those were temperatures. Those were temperatures. Those weren't precip. So that was temperature. This is precipitation. And again, you can see the chances for both April, May, and June are below average. So that's not a good thing either because that shows us that, hey, what's going to happen? What type of storms are coming in? What's going on with our, with our watersheds? 
Uh, this is the Salt River Project SRP watershed. So everything that's kind of collected in this area from Flagstaff, Prescott, Payson, all goes into these streams, all goes into the reservoirs, Roosevelt on the salt system, Roosevelt, Horse Mesa Dam, Mormon Flat Lake. Uh, then we on the Verde system, we have some more. We have Horseshoe, we have Bartlett uh, for those. So this is kind of, I just wanted to show you kind of what the watershed was for the Salt River Project. Um, now, our, our Salt River Project supplies are pretty good. In fact, they're great. Um, we, this, this whole little chart right here shows that we have about 55,000 acre feet. And you might say, what's an acre foot? It's about 325,000 gallons. 325,000, that's a lot of water. So we're only using out of this 55,000 acre foot amount, we're only using 21,000 of that. So we have 34,000 acre feet remaining of our SRP supply. And this, this supply actually is kind of granted both from SRP, but it is, uh, I guess, certified by the Arizona Department of Water Resources and something that's called the designation of assured water supply. We get this every 15 years. So they said in that designation, we have 55,000 acre feet of SRP water to use. So we still have 62% of total SRP supply still available. That's great for SRP. Our next slide. So we're pretty good right now. Our reservoirs are actually about 76% full. That actually went down a little bit. It's about 72. But it's still really good when you look at how much snow we've had this year. We really haven't, if you're a skier, not very much snow out there. Uh, we had a great monsoon, which really helped us in, the, in last summer. That really helped. In fact, we got more precept from the monsoon than we actually received this winter in snow. That's, that's usually not typical. Uh, the Verde reservoirs are at about 37% full. Uh, our total system is about 72% full. Last time this year was about 77. So we're doing really good on the SRP system, even though we haven't had a great winter. Um, the good thing about SRP, it's a really important supply for Glendale. Um, as you all know, if you have SRP water, it's a great source. Um, it's a smaller watershed other than the Colorado. You know, the Colorado's huge. But we can get a lot of rain and a lot of intense rain in our, in our watershed, which can produce a significant amount of, of runoff for that. Uh, plus, SRP has some groundwater uh, wells that they can use. They, if, if the reservoirs get too low, they'll turn those groundwater wells on, put that in the canal, and serve that. So it's a great backup system, almost a redundancy. And then we're working with SRP with several projects. Uh, they're looking at raising Bartlett Dam. Uh, we have other projects. I think we have about four or five going with SRP. They're really good about, hey, what can we do to get municipalities, including Glendale, more water for the citizens? And so they're doing a wonderful job at SRP. Uh, the good thing, uh, it, well, not really good, but we really can't recharge SRP underground. We have what we have. It's not legally um, through the Department of Water Resources, we cannot do that. But we can use it in different ways rather than recharging it. Um, we have adequate SRP now, as you saw in that big diagram, now and into the future. And uh, the drought does affect those surface water supplies that I talked about, this ongoing 22-year drought. But SRP uses more groundwater. And that watershed is so much smaller. Even though we have, we're in a 22-year drought, SRP has never really gone to crucial levels during that time, and, and they're not expecting to. They, they manage their reservoir system wonderfully along with their groundwater. So SRP's golden, really, really a good supply. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the Colorado River, which hasn't been faring as well as the Salt River. Of course, it's a huge area. It's from Wyoming. We go to Colorado, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico. It's a large area that contributes to the Colorado River. Um, Lake. So Lake Powell, all that, all that snow up in the upper mountains in Colorado and Wyoming, Wyoming melts during the spring. It goes into Lake Powell. Then from Lake Powell, it's transferred over to Lake Mead, where we can use it. It's taken to Lake Havasu, which then takes it out and puts it into our CAP Canal. So when you cross over that CAP Canal, that water in there has come from Wyoming, Colorado. It's traveled a long way. Um, and that's the CAP. It's 336 miles all the way from Lake Havasu to Tucson. It's a, it's a marvelous uh, engineering feat. 
So our Colorado River supply, as compared to our SRP, as you can see, we have 22,582 acre feet. And again, an acre foot is 325,000 gallons. We're using most of that right now because we, that's our demand. Um, we have a very small amount that we're not using, about 1,500 acre feet. So really, we only have about 6% of our CAP supply still available. But we're doing things about that. Um, the conditions in Lake Mead and Lake Powell are very, very bad right now. They're at the lowest level since the reservoirs have been filled. Um, and Lake Mead is down about 153 feet. Lake Powell is down 174. That's incredible. If you've gone to Las Vegas, you've seen that white ring around Lake Mead. You've probably seen pictures of Lake Powell, the same thing. It, it is really dire right now. Uh, the chance of power generation, not only water, but power generation in these dams is really reduced also. It's been reduced at Lake Mead through Hoover Dam, and it's been also um, at Glen Canyon Dam. It's also been greatly reduced. And there is a chance at, at uh, Lake Powell that the power may not, there's a certain level which they do not think they can produce power. So we're getting pretty close to that. We don't know when it's going to happen, it, but if conditions continue, we probably won't be able to get power out of Lake Powell. Uh, so more water is really taken out of Lake Mead than is put in. So we get transfers from Lake Powell. That's how we get water into Lake Mead every year. But because of the drought, there's been a much reduction in the inflows for Lake Powell, which go into Lake Mead. Uh, but measures have been put in place. You've probably heard a lot about this. We're just, you know, the water community is trying to do something about this. So uh, we did, first of all, in 2007, we, we saw this decline from 2000, that it was just dropping dramatically. So what they did is they did interim and guidelines, which gave little levels at, and cuts to the use of the water. So if it went to a certain level, we would cut it so much. Well, they found out that that wasn't working as much as it should based on the conditions. So in 2019, we came up with the drought contingency plan. This increased the amount of cuts at these levels even more to keep the water level in Lake Mead propped up. That didn't do it either. So in 2021, we came up with what was called the 500 plus plan to try to put at least 500,000 acre feet more into Lake Mead to keep that propped up. Um, and Glendale did participate and is participating in that just a little bit. We're taking 350 acre feet of our CAP just for this year and, and helping Lake Mead so it doesn't reach these catastrophic levels, which is a really great thing. And, and we thank also the council for, for, for looking at that also. It's been great. What's going to happen in 2026, we have a renegotiation of this first contract, which is the overall contract. We don't know what's going to happen with that because all of the upper basin states, Wyoming, Colorado, still want their water too. We want our water. So after 2026, it's going to be really interesting to see what comes out of this renegotiation of all these contracts. If you ever want to study something so complex to put you asleep at night, look at Law of the River because I'll tell you, it is so complex and there's probably – you know, from here to the ceiling, volumes and laws, and, and uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. So this is just an example of Lake Mead. We're starting in 2000 over here. You can see the drop to current levels. It's dropped that 100, over 150 feet. Um, this little blip was a great May we had. We had, a, a, we call it Miracle May. It, it, it rose Lake Mead by 30 feet. We wish that could happen again, but we don't see it coming. So all we see is really this decline in Lake Mead. What we're trying to do with all of those, the 500 plus plan and all those things that I tried, really trying to bend this curve back up so we can keep below these levels, which are really the deeper cuts. So each line there is a deeper cut. We're really trying to keep it above that. Next one. So um, like I said, most of that snow melt and other precip is captured in Lake Powell, and then Lake Powell transfers that to Lake Mead. So it's really Lake Powell that matters in all of this. Lake Mead does get some inflows, but we really care about Lake Powell and how much of that snow melt up in Colorado and Wyoming that we like to ski on is going into Lake Powell. You can see Lake Powell here. Back when it was, uh, I think it was like 1963, um, what happened with Lake Powell, it, it it, again, it's going down dramatically down to 2023. Um, we see this happening again um, 
and it's you can see this line. We really don't have enough to stop that. We we have things in Lake Mead that we can do. We can add more water. We can use less. But for Lake Powell, it's really dependent upon how much snow melts and how much goes in that reservoir. So we're starting to see this very participant drop down here that's just going, you know, we're very worried about this, especially with the power generation. So this is just a really, this is kind of a complicated, complicated graph, but what this really shows is how much snow right now is in the, the watershed. What is the snow water equivalent? So right here, this is, let's see, this is the median or the average of kind of what we've had during 19, from 1991 to 2020. Uh, this was, the green arrow was last year. You can see it kind of is matching. Not too bad, it was about 93% about of normal. You can see this year, we started off pretty bad and then we had all that snow, you know, in California. Well, what happened, it just kind of flatlined on us a little bit. Now it's starting to go up just a little bit more. We're hoping this continues. But all the forecasts seem like it's probably going to match probably what we had last year, which just isn't enough for Lake Powell. So um, it's trending a little bit above last year, but I think, like I said, it's going to go down. Um, researchers say that what we need really is 150% of average to get, to get enough runoff to go into Lake Powell. And it's a, it's a professor from Colorado State that is, is stating that. It's, so we need a lot more precip. It's so dry in the watershed. What happens is it just soaks in. It doesn't make it to the Colorado. So that, that is really the conditions. And when you see those drought conditions, you know, all the red in there, that is really the soil conditions that we're looking at. So it's a really bad condition for that. But this is the good news. So I gave you all the bad news. So this is the good news. So Glendale has been preparing for a long, long time. We have our designation of assured water supply from the Department of Water Resources. They look very carefully at this and they give us our water supply, how much we can use for developments and other growth in our city. Our SRP supply, like I, went, like I said before, is very strong. We're very confident in our SRP supply. Uh, and we're approaching, we, we, we knew this was coming years ago. So we have stored water underground. We have almost 200,000 acre feet underground in times of extreme drought that we can pull out and use for all of the citizens. So that is really a great, it's like a checking account. We have created a large savings account of water here in Glendale that we can pull out. Um, and also, uh, we have a very, very strong water portfolio. And that's, that's the best thing right now. It's, you know, we have, and we're doing things to also increase that portfolio. We're working with SRP. Uh, we're putting in redundancy. We're putting in some wells up in our CAP area just in case we, we you know, we start getting declines. The other good thing, I, I think we have another slide. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, Glendale's going to be given water credits. So let's say the SRP, or excuse me, the CAP supply starts going very critically low. The Arizona Water Bank has stored I believe it's about 3.2 million acre feet in Maricopa County, exactly for times like this. So uh, they kind of anticipated, hey, the Colorado, it's a natural system. They will be giving municipalities and Glendale enough water for a 20% cut of our Colorado River. So that's a great thing to have. They're gonna be giving that, it's water that's stored underground. They're going to be giving us either credits so we can pump that out or actual water that we can use. So it is a really great thing and the state has prepared for that. It's called the Arizona Water Banking Authority. Great, great, uh, along with our 200,000. So that's a really, that's, that's a really nice thing to have that double banking account. It's kind of like my wife and I having, you know, both accounts, I like that. I like taking it out of hers though, so. Um, so, and we are doing projects for new wells, like I said, and, and they're expensive and you know, we realize that we have to do this. And, you know, we, we want that redundancy. We don't want any citizen to be out of water. We do not want to see any of that. So we are planning for all of that. And, and that's the great thing. We have that, that foresight and our director of water services is planning that is very supportive as is council on that. So we really do appreciate that for all, all the citizens for the future. Um, and like I said, we're working with SRP. SRP is great. They're always coming up with these new ideas. We really can't keep up with them because they're always going, hey, what are we going to do? Let's do this. Let's raise this dam. Let's do this over here. Fantastic. So um, SRP is a fantastic organization. 
And the Central Arizona Project is also, but they have to deal with other things like that nasty shortage up in Colorado. Um, and as Joanne will be telling you, conservation. We have, I think, the best conservation team in all maybe Arizona and maybe, maybe even the United States. Joanne's team is fantastic. They are so great, and they have such passion. I know Council Member uh, Clark was talking about that passion for, for Glendale. They have it. You know, and it's all the table stuff. It's all the all the things, and they really do a fantastic job on conservation. Looking at what happens if there's a really bad drought, how are we going to handle that with our drought management plan? So Joanne will be talking about that, and uh, and she's she's fantastic. So I think that is it, and uh, I guess we'll save questions to the end, maybe, or let's do that. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Drew. Man, I, I have to say, I'm such a fan of Drew. He just does such a great job of explaining things that's so complicated legally, numbers-wise, in an easy-to-understand manner. And I'm biased because, you know, Drew's from the Midwest. I'm from Chicago originally. So, you know, oh, all right, Chicago. So my name is Joanne Toms. I'm the Environmental Program Manager. I've been with the city since 2005. And then I was a water conservation specialist in that time. And then in 2015, I was promoted to the Environmental Program Manager. And I really love my job. I, I sincerely mean that. Uh, when I was in high school in the 90s, I just knew around 15, so I was a sophomore, that I wanted to have a job where I could help the environment. And so here I am, you know, a few years later, um, you know, living, living that dream, helping citizens every single day. So um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Council Member Clark, for the invitation, uh, Shannon for organizing the goodies. And then um, our Public Affairs Department, we're in this really cool facility. So I know the viewers um, on Facebook can't see, but we're in this uh, media room and there's a big green screen and I'm kind of distracted by it because it's this very green color. But Mike, I'm kind of inspired. I'm thinking maybe we need to do like a water conservation, like action hero. And if you need a star, look no further. Okay. So I am gonna get a little bit more serious because we are talking about the city's drought management plan. And I don't want you all to be alarmed, but I do want you to be aware about this plan. So this plan is a good thing. It helps us prepare for when we do have a potential water shortage, okay? This plan is very common. Um, there's other cities that have water, uh, or excuse me, drought plans. It's actually required by state law. It's in our city code. So don't think that this is something that's like out of the ordinary. This is a good thing that will help bridge the gap from when there's a, a, you know, a gap between the supply and demand, okay? So I think sometimes people get really alarmed. They're like, oh no, I'm never gonna be able to water my lawn again. That's not true. There's various stages and we wanna make sure that each stage is, is tolerable. Each stage gets more serious. Um, but a big part of the city's drought management plan is communication. So every time that we're in a stage, you're gonna know what stage we're in. I don't care if I have to fly an airplane. Uh, well, that would be ridiculous because I don't know how to fly an airplane. But you know, we'll have that information in our connection. We'll be partnering with Channel 11 to have uh, you know, commercials about that. You will not be surprised and you will know what actions are required from all of you, okay? So just I just wanna alleviate a little bit of the anxiety about that because I, I, it's something that, you know, we haven't been in, in a drought stage since 2004, before I started with the city of Glendale. So some of you may not, you know, may not have even remembered that. Back in the day, we were in what's called a stage one, and it was voluntary. It was voluntary for our external customers like yourself to reduce your water use. Um, the last time it was updated, it was in 2016. Drew and I and Megan have been updating it, and that's because things have been very dynamic on the Colorado River. Um, you know, Drew talked about the drought contingency plan, that federal law. Recently, the 500 plus plan, that just came about just a few months ago. So things are changing really rapidly and it's all dependent on mother nature. Um, you heard that a big source of our water supply actually is snowpack up in the mountains, who knew? And so mother nature is kind of controlling some things, but we have plans to adapt and to deal. Um, Thank you, Megan. So there are different drought stages. So we have stage zero just means normal, and then there's four different stages. So there's a stage one, two, three, and four. And I use the acronym WADE, W-A-D-E, to help me remember them because I look at the plan, I don't look at it for a week, and then I forget some of the stages. So stage one is a watch, 
Stage two is an alert. Stage three is a declaration. And stage four is an emergency. So it's just good to know what you know each of the stages, what they are. Um, in the drought management plan, there's water reduction measures, OK? So stage one and two, it's voluntary. We're just encouraging people, keep doing what you're doing. Keep being responsible water users here in the Sonoran Desert. And stage three and four, then those mandatory, uh, or excuse me, those reduction measures become mandatory. So you're thinking, okay, what are these reduction measures? Well, they all focus on outdoor water use. So we would be, you know, discouraging the use of ornamental fountains, right? That's kind of a luxury. We would be discouraging irrigation or restricting that to certain days and times. And that's determined by, you know, uh, city management and council on what those days will be. We want to be flexible. We also will be prohibiting water waste. You know, water waste is never a good thing when you have water running down the street. We also will be uh, prohibiting overseeding winter grass, and this is in the later stages. And then we will also be um, prohibiting washing of vehicles, again, in the later stages. So all of these things, they're all outdoors, right? And they're not impacting our indoor water use. We need indoor water use. We need to be able to have water for health and safety, okay? So the water reduction measures that we have in, in Glendale, again, very typical of what you would see in other cities. In fact, cities in the Midwest have drought management plans. Who knew? So the, again, None of you will be surprised, and it's gradual as far as what each of those stages are. One thing that I do want to note is that the city, we have to lead by example. So for all four stages, those wa we have water reduction goals. And so we'll be looking at the city's potable water use, and we'll make sure that we're re reducing our water use by 5, 10, 15, and 20 percent under each of those different stages. So that's what we have in the plan now, but we need to make sure that our plan goes in front of city management and then council as well. So I do want to share a good story. You know, we've been hearing about um, you know, the shortage on the Colorado River, but conservation is working. So if you look at this chart, you'll see that the population is, or excuse me, the years are from 2000 to 2019. And then you'll also see our water use on the y-axis and then the population also on the y-axis. So you'll see that from 2000 to 2019, our population increased by 5%, but our water use decreased by 17%. That's incredible. And we know some of it hopefully is coming from your water conservation manager, um, you know, cheering everybody on and having classes and workshops, which I'll get into. But a lot of it is also because homes are just becoming more and more efficient. You know, a lot of the uh, uh, devices, appliances, fixtures, toilets were, um, you know, very inefficient back in the day. And then over time, they've gotten better, they perform better, and they've got, uh, become more efficient. So I always use this story, and poor Megan and Drew have probably heard this 20 times, but uh, my house was built in 1979, and when we moved in, you know, we probably had a toilet that was using like seven gallons per flush. I can't be living that. You know, that's not my truth. So for my 40th birthday, I went to a big box store and bought by myself and loaded it by myself a 0.8 gallon per flush toilet. So think of the savings just from one small change. I didn't install it myself, but from one small purchase, it didn't change my behavior. It was just a one-time purchase. So that's incredible. Um, yeah, I encourage you all to look at you know, your water use at your house as well and see what, what you can do to become even better. So a great success story. So I do want to let everybody know about the city's water conservation program. The program is a council approved program. Uh, 1985 council said, yes, let's have a water conservation program. Um, at the time, the average person's water use was 212 gallons per person per day. Fast forward almost 40 years later, and that's dropped down to the 150s. So you all have done a great job. I'm, I'm so proud of everybody. Keep up the great work because we need you. We need conservation um, and to help bring that demand down. So we have a bunch of programs. Um, so much of what we do is education and outreach. I'm excited that there's a school board um, member here because we work with schools. K to 18, we're working with those, or K to 12, uh, we're working with those students. And 
Um, that's one of my favorite things, actually, is to motivate the, the young uh, population. I remember as a child of the 80s, you know, learning about recycling, and then I would go home and I would just like rat on the family. I was like, that's, you got, Dad, you got to put that in the recycle bin. And that's what the kids do. Um, and we've made sure that our program has adapted to the time. So, you know, a big thing now in education is something called STEAM. Um, that's science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And so we make sure that our program aligns with the state academic standards. We have an adult education program. COVID, we didn't skip a beat. You know what? Because we offered classes in Zoom. Right now, we're doing a hybrid where we have some uh, of our workshops, our classes that focus a lot of them on landscaping, actually. Um, we're doing them Zoom and also in person. Uh, we have had people from Australia on our Zoom classes. I mean, I'm believing them, um, but it's incredible the reach with Zoom. So we didn't let COVID take us down. We just kept offering classes, and a lot of those classes are now on the city's website. So you, I think we have like over, I think about 20 classes now that um, were recorded, and you can watch them at you know on demand whenever is convenient for you. Uh, the landscape rebate program, again, that's a, a council approved program to incentivize the conversion of grass to zero escape. Because we know not everybody wants, you know, to have 4,000 square feet of grass. Maybe they want to bring that down to just like 1,000 square feet. So the city will pay you to take out that grass and convert it to desert landscape. And this also extends for single family residential customers and multi family and also commercial customers. We also do landscape consultations and water budgets. Believe it or not, that's one of my favorite things to do is get my backpack on, my hat, my clipboard, my overalls, and then just walk a property, whether it's an HOA or a single family property. Again, because 60% of your water use is gonna be outdoors, not indoors. We've made great gains in indoor water efficiency, but the big bucket now is outdoors. My favorite thing to do, if you ever want a landscape consultation, you're curious about how your irrigation timer works, call us. Um, we also do water efficiency assessments for commercial properties, for schools, and that's another word for that would be a, a water audit, but audit kind of scares people away, so we're like, eh, it's an assessment, it's a checkup. Um, and that's, we've done that for churches, for grocery stores, we even did one at the arena. I've never seen so many toilets and sinks in my life. Um, we do water waste investigations. So if you have a, you know, a neighbor who maybe has an irrigation system that goes off at you know, 6 in the morning, but they're long gone at work, um, and you know, you, maybe you're not comfortable talking to them, we will reach out to them and just say, hey, not sure if you knew, but looks like you got an irrigation leak. Here's some brochures to help you. Again, our, it's education, we're friendly, we're definitely champions of wise water use. So um, we definitely want you to take advantage of that. And you all have been hearing about Glendale One, right? That's the system. And just like Councilmember Clark said, you know, we respond quickly because we don't want that escalating. Um, you know, I'm a resident of a different city, but still I sometimes report things to my city. And so I try to really relate as a customer. You know, I want to hear from my city in a couple days. I don't want it to be like weeks later. So we try to be very reciprocal of that. And then the Xeriscape Demonstration Garden, that's a beautiful garden that surrounds the Glendale Public Library. We just worked with Glendale uh, High School. We worked with 20 some students and they just did a renovation at the Glendale Main Library's front entrance. And it's now called the succulent space because we love alliteration. So check it out if you haven't. Um, we have some netting going around some of the plants because what, what's at the Glendale Main Library? The peacocks, the peacocks. yes. Yeah, so um, we had to, you know, they, they see the new plants literally after planting. They're like pecking away at stuff and we had to put some chicken wire around there. So I feel like the peafowl whisperer. I'm like, come on, this way, this way. Next slide, please. So again, with the rebate program, this, I love showing this infographic because this communicates how many customers such as yourself have participated in this program. So since 1986, over 5,000 500 residents have converted a collectively 116 acres of grass. And so acre, not everybody kind of knows like visually what that is. Eh, it's about a football field. So think of 116 acres, 116 football fields of unwanted grass converted to a desert friendly landscape. And it's about a million gallons of um, water use per acre. So that's continually 116 million gallons of water being saved year after year after year. So if you are a customer, 
Single family, you can get up to $750. If you have a new home, $200. And then for our HOAs, schools, businesses, you can get up to $3,000 per fiscal year. And we've had some HOAs that have had so much property that, you know, and they can't afford to do all of that property. Um, they can apply year after year after year. So it's a great program. Uh, the Glendale Water Efficiency Program, that's the same program that we call our assessments. So if you see here, we also do assessments at our own city properties. How can we be telling customers to be water wise if we're not practicing what we preach? So we've done assessments at 19 city facilities, 2.5 million gallons of water savings, 24 businesses that I mentioned, like grocery stores, 16.8 um, million gallons of water of identified water savings. Next slide, please. Uh, also, some good news is that we just recently received a Bureau of Reclamation Water Smart Grant. This is a $50,000 grant to the city to help our customers improve water efficiency through irrigation system technology and upgrades. And we know a lot of our properties, you know, with so much development in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, that those irrigation systems, you know, can use a little bit of an upgrade. So we definitely want to make these funds available to HOAs and schools. And then also some of you, if you, who reads the connection, the Glendale connection? Okay. And I kind of have to apologize because we promoted these new conservation kits funded by APS and then we made 350 kits like in the matter of a month and we ran out of devices but we ordered devices and so those kits will be back up and running um, on march 15th go to glendaleaz.com forward slash water conservation look for a gray box that says request a free kit and then you can register to get your free kit and guess what pick it up at your closest glendale public library maybe it's heroes so um, that's we're very uh, supportive of, uh, grateful, I should say, to APS. And then now that that grant is over, the city is uh, sponsoring that. Um, but great items, you get a free high efficiency shower head and uh, you know, all sorts of good stuff. And then I think I have, oh, this was at the last slide. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. Right, right oh. The mic. oh, sorry, that's right. Turning on, okay. Concerning the, uh, landscape you know change it to stone or whatever is that all your grass throughout the front and backyard or can it just be a certain part yeah so great question with the landscape rebate program the question was you know is it just your front yard or your backyard guess what you can do it twice so some people we've had people that did their front yard 10 years ago and they were saving up money to be able to do their backyard so we have it all documented when we've worked with customers whether they did their front yard their backyard and then their square footage so um, the minimum amount that you have to take out is 500 square feet of grass and convert that to a desert friendly landscape does that answer your question okay thank you um, mine is in regards to residential flood irrigation um, SRP is in charge of that. Um, where does that water come from? So the question is about residential flood irrigation. So from my familiarity at the city, um, there, there is SRP and we actually reached out to them so that we can create a map of all of the SRP flood irrigation customers in the city of, of Glendale. And that water comes through, I want to say the Arizona Canal, is that correct? So that's, you know, and that's operated by SRP. So. Um, that's a good question. There's also a private flood irrigation district called Sunburst Farms, and that's kind of in the northern part of the city. And then also the city of Glendale has, I want to say about two to 300 internal flood irrigation customers, tend to be around like the historic district. Because that's um, where I live. I live in the historic district. Okay. And they said our pipes are like 100 years old. Yes, they are. And so <laughs> I'm like, what happens, you know, if we, we have an issue? Right, so the flood irrigation, um, if you have you know questions about that, we do, the City Water Services Department does um, maintain that and offer the water, and so um, if you have any issues, I would definitely recommend that you call our Water Services Department. Yeah, because my house is 98 years old. Oh, that's amazing. And, and so, yeah. I'm looking, 98, 100-year-old pipe. Uh, we're kinda, you know, so um, I'm walking a crack line there. You know? Right, sure, yeah, definitely, you know, if. You, 
yeah, feel free to reach out to us. We can give you our cards or call our water services main number. It's kind of nice to talk to a person, though, that you know, right? So grab one of our cards. Yep. The 200,000 gallons of water that Glendale has stored somewhere, just out of curiosity, where do you have that stored? Well, I may have to pass this on to Drew, but it's, you know, there's the new Agua Fria underground storage project that's uh, kind of out by the airport. Okay. Um, that's, uh, that's an area where we're storing water, um, but there's other projects as well in the valley. So I'll let you, I'll let, uh, oh, we also have our West Area Water Reclamation Facility. Okay. Um, call that wharf, but there's other other projects. So Drew, do you want to talk about the, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for her before I kick her off the stage? <laughs> They, they all did a good job. So I, I think that ought to convince you that Glendale is handling its water responsibly. Now, we're going to run over probably a few minutes past 8. Shannon, don't look at me like that. Okay. Um, are there any, do, does anybody have a question that's not related to the topics that were presented tonight? Yes, right here, Mike. When are we getting a grocery store? <laughs> I love you. Um, I have been trying for 20 years to get a grocery store. We're the only district. I mean, we have Ranch Market, but I don't shop at Ranch Market. We have that Super Walmart. I don't shop at the Super Walmart either. Isn't there supposed to be one near the new fancy old um, there, Stonehenge? Yeah, Stonehenge, otherwise known as Stonehaven. There's, there's acreage on the northeast corner of Camelback and 91st that is specifically commercially zoned for a grocery store. However, we're dealing with one of my favorite entities in the whole world, John F. Long Trust. And I think trust is a misplaced word. Anyhow, they promised to put in a fries. I have asked repeatedly whether they are moving forward with that, and I'm getting crickets. So uh, it is their obligation and their responsibility to put a grocery store in at that corner. Now, when it will happen, I can't tell you right now. But you would think by next year, we will have an additional 15,000 residents in the Yucca District. We will become the largest district in the city. We will have approximately 55,000 people in the Yucca District. The other districts will have about 41, 42,000. We are also the largest district geographically. And we are the largest economic engine in the city. I don't know if any of you have read, but Nestle Corporation, um, they have expanded their original plan for the project. There will be over 350 jobs at the Nestle plant alone. And those jobs will start in the neighborhood of fifty to sixty thousand dollars. Um do you know do you, you know where or I don't know if you know where, it's over by the three oh three where uh Roush and Ball it's it's called Wolf Logistics Center. It's by Reams Road and and the three oh three. And, and so uh, it seems like everybody in the Valley has really paid attention to Nestle. Nestle's a big, not just national corporation, but international corporation. I was told today uh, that with Nestle coming, all of those industrial plants that are going in and along the 303, their investment will total $2 billion with a B. Glendale represents 40% of all the industrial development occurring in the valley. We are a powerhouse these days. Any other questions about any other topics? 
Uh, Mike, we got one here. Thank you. Um, Heroes Lake has been open about two months-ish. Thank you for getting that done finally. But And it is beautiful and we see people out there all the time. I'm curious what kind of complaints or compliments or anything are you guys getting? I haven't, I don't go there at night. We're, we're getting a lot of compliments and so far no complaints. Good. And we're not getting complaints about of homeless, homeless Good. because people are using the park. Good. And when they use that park, they chase the homeless out. Right. Good. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I should tell you, because I'm proud of this happening, looks like I'm going to get funding to develop the sports fields, which would be in the north east corner of the park, that big dirt vacant portion. I uh, don't know exactly what kind of sports fields right now. We might start with soccer and then add basketball, but they're coming. We will have sports fields hopefully within a year. And then my next <coughs> final item is the Recreation and Aquatic Center, which is like uh, over a $20 million price tag. That's the tough nut to crack, is getting the funding for that. But I think I can do it before I leave. Uh, right. John. Super Bowl's coming next year, supposedly. There's always this talk about it yeah. being pulled. Yeah. Has council heard anything about that yet? And is the NFL experience going to be in Glendale instead of downtown Phoenix? I don't know. In answer to your second question, where the experience is going to be, I don't think they know yet or have planned for it yet. Um, yes, we are heavily participating with the host committee in planning for the Super Bowl. And in fact, every time the year before we actually host the Super Bowl, we usually send a certain number of staff to the current Super Bowl to see, to get updated on how they handle security and so on. And we did do that this year. We sent, I think, five staff people to the Super Bowl to they never saw the game. They didn't have a ticket. So we didn't pay thousands of dollars for tickets. But what they did do was to check behind the scenes and see how the, the, the Super Bowl was being hosted. Any other questions? Yes, right here. Uh, Joyce, I want to thank you for Heroes Park. I'm there pretty much every morning. Um, real quickly, uh, I've been a part-time employee at Gila River Arena for over 17 years. Um, and I just, as an employee, want to tell you, thank you, City of Glendale, for clarifying um, the relationship with the, feed, with the coyotes. Um, there's a lot of bad talk about Glendale, but um, over the years, uh, Glendale has stood by the coyotes and yes, done so much uh, for that franchise. I want to thank you for that. I also just wonder if the city could clarify sometimes just that whole situation uh, because uh, people misunderstand. Uh, you hear things like, isn't it terrible that Glendale booted the coyotes out of the city? Uh, now they're homeless. <laughs> but, we did uh, boot them. <laughs> but you know, just uh, maybe, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe just a press release occasionally or, or something. Um, the, the arena is going to be tremendous uh, future-wise. Things are going to be great. Um, but there's a lot of misunderstanding in the community. Yeah, yeah there is. And, and Glendale has been bad mouth for years uh, by the East Valley and people complaining about having to drive out to Glendale. Um, and I won't even get into that whole situation. And, and I think what precipitated our decision to, to frankly boot them out was the fact that they were already crowing about how Glendale was untenable. They didn't want to be in Glendale. And we said, oh, well, maybe it's time to take a look at that. So we did an economic study, and we found out that we made 23% more sales tax from a concert than we do a hockey game, even though there are more hockey games, OK? I think, and I keep preaching to everybody, I think what is going to dramatically change West Glendale and Glendale 
is the Crystal Lagoon Resort. They have already upped, they were, they were starting with 600 hotel rooms. They're now building for 900 hotel rooms. And it looks like we're gonna get a boutique hotel in Westgate at the northwest corner of 91st and Maryland. Okay, they're gonna add another 100 plus rooms. Within the space of a year, we will have another 1,000 hotel rooms. I mean, it's incredible. But what Crystal Lagoons projects itself is that it anticipates around 12 million visitors a year. Wow is right. There, we're projecting right now that that project alone is going to generate nearly $10 million a year in sales tax to the city of Glendale. That is an incredible amount of money. And yes, I know you're sighing because the traffic will get worse. <laughs> yeah, I know it. I live, I live a mile away from it. You live a mile away from it. And I think we'll all adjust and learn to stay away from certain areas, which I do now anyhow. And I know somebody's going to ask me a question about 83rd between Glendale and Northern. It is the crappiest road in Glendale. <laughs> We're all agreed on that. I, I, I'm a little disappointed because I got money in the budget last year for design of, because they have to do design before they reconstruct or build anything in Glendale. Now they tell me it was for scoping work and that the actual design will be done this year. So it's gonna be another year before we see uh, now, I've, ta I've talked to the city manager, and he says if it's possible to be speeded up, he will do that. Uh, question? Mike. Yeah, I have a question for you, Jason. Oh, Thanks for you, everything that you've done. Um, at Westgate, parking, because um, the one thing that I noticed over, there's a lack of parking there, and I know that the new chicken and pickle place that's going to be opening up, it's going to take away more All spots. that parking to the east of the uh, theater. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, also, too, with the Coyotes, too, is, is what I've noticed is the um, when they have events, especially on Saturdays, there's no parking for people to go to Westgate. You, you know? have to direct that to, yeah. West, to well, well, Bob well, Parsons. Well, I'm saying that's, that's a lost revenue for Glendale because yes. people aren't spending. Well, we, we don't earn revenue from parking in, uh, in I'm not Westgate. Talking, I'm talking they can't go to the places, you know, to even go out to eat because the parking is being taken up. Well, but, but we don't, we only own one or two small parcels in right. Westgate. The rest of it is owned by Bob Parsons. Have you ever heard of Go Daddy? Yeah. That's where he made his money. He owns Westgate. Right. And he's the one who would make the decision. And I think it's coming sooner than later. They're gonna have to bite the bullet and put in a couple of parking garages. But That's they're expensive. Figured. They're like 25 million, and that was a couple of years ago. They're like 25 million a piece. And with inflation the way it is, it's probably cost more than that. Question over here. What can you tell us about the new property going in at 83rd and Northern there, the Peoria Glendale County oh, development? Oh, uh, the where the Rovi Farms? Right. That's, that's a master plan community, and 95% of it is in Peoria. We only have one small sliver in Glendale that's gonna be called Roby Farm. Well, they can't call it Roby Farm. We already have a Roby Farm. I don't know what they'll call it. But 95% of it is in Peoria, and Peoria is getting the 45 foot wide lots. Yay, over there. I negotiated with the, one of the home builders, the developers, and we're going to get lots on our side that will accommodate RV gates. So our side will be far nicer than their side. Is the dairy going to be gone Pardon? Is the dairy going to be moved? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't, don't, it's going to be moved, but how fast they move it is anybody's guess, because most of it's going to be done in Peoria and only one little sliver in Glendale. So they're talking over a 10-year time span to move the dairy. But if you notice, 
all those box trees at 83rd and Northern, they're all for sale. So you know they're making preparations to go. Any other questions? Over here. Yeah, I'm, I've noticed there's, a, I guess, a sign right there at 91st and Glendale on the east, uh, southeast side, I guess, with the, um, I guess there's an upcoming um, meeting about rezoning that. And it looks like 91st. it's a multi, um, 91st and Glendale on the southeast corner. Um, There's already Glen 95, yeah. and then behind that, moving further it's south, north further of south. Acadia Road, yep. the developer has worked with all of the neighbors that live along Acadia Road. Do you live along? I live in that. I live right here on Maryland and 89th. Okay. Worked with the people who live along Acadia Road. Yes, they are going to be putting in apartments there. They're going to graduate the height. Mm -hmm. So the ones that bound along Glendale Avenue are actually single-story owner occupied like condos or townhouses and then as you move further northward they they're two-story and then when they get close to um, what's it called Glen 91 apartments then they go up to four stories. So how are they planning on managing the traffic in and out there? Are they gonna use that? I, I know there's like a new roadway that's Devel just developer has to there's only like one lane on Ocotillo. Yeah. The developer has to put in the other half of yeah. Ocotillo. But further up from that, there's I see they're they're putting in like a road. It looks like they're putting in a roadway there where they've been doing a lot of construction. I live like I say I come out of 91st up um, a lot. That's where my main way to get over the 101. Which, like I say, I lived here since before any of that was here, and it's been a drag me too. On me. Yeah. It's been it's been very difficult. Um, Whenever there's an event, you guys block it. It gets blocked off. I can't. I can't get out of my house and without going far east to get well, I, anywhere. Well, th that's what I was going to say. I know it sounds crass. It's but you're going to have to go east yeah. to go west. Well, I go north and then I cut through the back, and yeah, even that is is kind of yeah, coming yeah. out of the north side of the the. Uh, the rule of the road is yeah. wherever a developer is developing. And Where his property adjoins a road, he's got to widen that road and improve the road. Yeah. So what I'm seeing with Glendale um, between the 101 and 91st Avenue is really that that's building up so much, it's becoming like the traffic congestion that we see it. I see it bell. And I'm seeing all this additional development going on there. And it, I'm, I'm afraid that our... Um, the, the amount of additional traffic that's coming into there is going to outpay or is going to outpace our ability to compensate and develop that area, develop the roadway enough to manage it. We're already it's already getting to the point where I if I'm going north, I bypass going you know west on uh, Glendale mm -hmm. and go all the way up to Northern because mm -hmm. there's only one light and then I can get on. I the use Northern as well and, and try to just, avoid you know, Glendale. Those are the kind of things that it's just getting to be. Um, you know, from a s traffic standpoint, it's just getting to be a bother. Uh, the fact that I can't go straight across Maryland and get on the 101. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, when they block it off for all the events, there's really no need not to, not to allow traffic to go straight through there anymore. I mean, when we didn't know what was going to happen with that, I, know, I think everybody who lived in, in our development really wanted it to, um, didn't want that traffic coming in. But now that we understand that you're going to be blocking it off anyway, so nobody can get into you know into the development, just let us go through. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask again. I've only asked six times, but I'll give it another shot. That's the transportation department and their traffic studies. But I'd be more than happy yeah. to nag at them some more. I could sit out there and take video of all the people who do it anyway. I I've yeah, me too. I've seen people shoot across. In, in, in the hell with what the sign says. Some of yeah. our officers and everything yeah. else, and it's just you know, it's just you know, I, I see it so much, mm -hmm. and you know, it, point well yeah. taken. Yeah, it's very well not, taken. It's not, it's not, it's not worth it. I mean, it's it's creating a hazard to people who go through that intersection because people are doing it wrong so much yeah. that it's, it's going. It, it is kind of getting to be the normal, but you know, somebody's going to wind up in a serious accident because they're not managing it properly. I agree. So. Anything else? 
Um, we'll take this gentleman and, and then uh, you. Uh, Camelback Ranch. Years ago, you were supposed to build a, a hotel and shops and restaurants. Over I there. think that's finally coming. Is it? Yeah. Um, the baseball teams have control of that land. There are two famous used car salesmen in my life. One was Elman, Steve Elman. The other was Ralph Burton, who promised to build around the, the ballpark called Main Street. Both of these guys went belly up many years ago. Um, since that time, council has worked with the baseball clubs. They have control of that land now. They issued an RFP for development of the land surrounding surrounding that area, and we have not heard the results of their decision on which RFP they have accepted, but I expect to hear within the next month or so. Also keep in mind, up by 99th and Ballpark Boulevard, okay, there's all that land on the northwest corner. That's called Vision 2. That's owned by two gentlemen who have finally created a master plan for that area. They're going to plant what we all hate, apartments. But along the 91st Avenue side, it's all going to be commercial and retail. 99th. Yeah, 99th and Ballpark Boulevard. Maybe we'll get our grocery store there. Who knows? Any other questions? Yes. Recently, there's been, you mentioned it, um, southeast corner of 83rd Avenue and Glendale, a QT going in, and you're saying no to that. What are your reasonings for saying no to I have a QT? very strong reason for saying no. Have you noticed the abandoned Texaco on the northeast yeah. corner? Forever, It's yes. been abandoned for 20 yeah. years. 7-Eleven yeah. 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 bought that land. They submitted a design proposal that was accepted by the Planning Commission by the council. Then they heard Quick Trip was coming in across the street. Now they're selling the land again. If Quick Trip comes in on that southeast corner, I can guarantee you that northeast corner will be abandoned for another 20 years. Right. I'd rather That's have QT than 7-Eleven. The I, I agree. We don't, especially with the Biden administration pushing no fossil fuel. Have you looked at the gas prices today? Oh my God. Yes. We're, we're moving, kicking and screaming toward electric cars. I, I wonder if they ever wonder where electricity comes from, which is a whole nother matter. But we're moving in the direction of electric cars. And in fact, I talked to the city manager today and I said, you know, we need someone who's a long range planner who is going to look at trends for the future. We don't need gas stations on every corner anymore. We need to develop planning criteria that show the necessity for some of these things being planted. And if they can't show the necessity and the need, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be allowed. And th I think that's the way the city will eventually go. They're slow, it might take them a year or two or three, but I think that's the wave of the future. We will control, especially at intersections, what, what may be planted there. Anything else? Gosh, you were a good group tonight. I love having all of you here. All right, we're gonna do the drawings, Shannon. You're finally going to get to go home in a few minutes. <laughs> I'm going to let you pick because, be, because then it's, uh, we're going to draw for the history book first. All right, Bill, you get the history book. He's got about four of them, but pick somebody else's name.
<laughs> Gary, do you have five of them too? All right, it's yours. All right, next up, and and for all the concerts, and is this for the Coyotes game? They get three tickets also. Yes. Yeah, like all right, whatever concert or Coyotes game, you're going to get three tickets. They're not transferable, so if you're not going to use them, decline them. First one is for Mercy Me concert. I have no idea. I'm so old. No, I don't recognize any of these names anymore. What? Say. It's Christian? Well, a lot of you, including me, would like to go to that. <laughs> Kathy, you're going to the Mercy Me concert. Yeah. The next, and the next for three tickets is for the... Now, this is memorable because they're only going to be playing a few more games at the arena. Is the Coyotes game with the Sharks. Three tickets. Who's, who's up? All right. You got three tickets to a Coyotes game. <laughs> next, next up is Journey. So tell me about Journey. What is Journey? Journey is for the Journey concert, which seems to be a big deal. Okay. Oh my God. All right, you go, you got the three tickets. And then the last set of tickets is for the Blackhawks and the Coyotes game. And Blackhawks are good. They'll they'll wipe the floor. Oh yeah, they will. Oh. Just tell me it's not Bobek or Jokowitz. All right. Well, congratulations. You got three tickets. And that's it, right, Shannon? There aren't any more. All right, I want to thank everybody for taking the time. I just killed two and a half hours of your night. <laughs> right? You can go home and take a nap. But I want to thank you all for coming, and we'll do this again in the fall. Thank you very much.